Recall that this is the characteristic table for a D flip-flop. Now, it may seem unusual that an input of zero gets me an output of zero and an input of one gets me an output of one. Why is this circuit so complicated if all it does is give me the same value I put into it? So the important thing to remember is that this transition assumes that a clock tick has occurred. So if the clock gives a value of 1 at the same time that d is 0, then the next value of q will be 0. Whenever there is not a clock tick, the sequential circuit is bistable, like all of the flip-flops and latches we talked about, so it will maintain its previous value. Now we can abstract the circuitry we saw in the previous video by simply putting it in a box and looking only at the inputs and outputs. Here we have our clock. So we'll have an input line, and this is the data line, hence the D data flip-flop. And this is clock input. And then Q will be the actual value that is stored in the sequential circuit. And we can also access not Q, although in practice we'll often discard this value. However, it is needed internally for the circuit to remember the bit that it's storing. Now, recall that D also can mean delay, and that's because the change in output is delayed until the clock tick occurs. So one way to use a D flip-flop like this is to take several of them and combine them into a register. So I will be representing a 4-bit register using four of these D flip-flops. So let me draw out the flip-flops. Note that I have left out Q's negation since I do not need that value here. So we have four D flip-flops. Let's see how the input and output lines are wired to these flip-flops. We will have an input for each data line. So these are the data lines here. And we'll go ahead and label them. So be D, and I'll say 1, 3. So the first one represents that it's an input, and the second value is the bit position. So we have the third, second, first, and then zeroth bit position. So here are the input data lines, and then Q from each of these will be our output lines. These are the output lines. And we will label them D03, D02, D01, and D00. Now, what's interesting about this 4-bit register is how we wire the clock. So I want all of these flip-flops to update their contents at the same time. So I have a single line here that goes into the clock input of each flip-flop, meaning that if there are some inputs coming in on these data lines, they will not be able to change the internally stored Q values until the clock tick occurs. That clock 
update will strike all of these at roughly the same time and then the stored values in the register will go from their previous values to their new values more or less simultaneously and then until a new one signal comes in along this line the outputs will continue to be the same as whatever value is stored. But here is a further bit of cleverness. I'm not going to hook this line directly to the clock. I'm going to hook it to an AND gate. This AND gate will have two inputs. One of them is the clock. So that will go into here. But the other is a load signal. Now the point of the load signal is to indicate to the register that I want to store a new value in it. And so what happens is if the register stores a value, it will continue to do so until a value of 1 comes along this line. When a program commands this register to load in a new value, a signal of 1 will come in along this load line and the new value to be loaded in will come along these data lines. Then when the clock ticks to 1, the 1 and 1 here will send a 1 through all of these clock inputs the waiting values will be loaded in simultaneously and from that point forward until the next time when a load is signaled along with a clock tick the output lines will continue to have those same values. This simple 4-bit register can be extended to more bits by simply adding more D flip-flops.